This is the Rock House Center Podcast, and I'm John Murphy. I'm Beth Murphy, and we're going to talk today about why it can be so difficult to trust God, the barriers to trusting Him, and why people feel like they would, would like to be able to trust God, but find that they really just cannot. It's really important. I mean, if someone wants to get to the peace that they're really desiring and yearning for, you can't get there around the God question. Is he trustworthy? Do you trust him? That peace is so dependent on trusting God. And that's the way God built us so that we would pursue him until we find him and and lean on him and trust in him. But there's a really important aspect of that, which is, is that you have to know that he is trustworthy. You have to know him. It's really important to understand uh, who he really is. Knowing him and his character relationally in the depth of our heart is where trust resides. Because if we just, we sort of academically know about him, but we have a whole different, I guess, heart impression or heart stamp of God and his character, then we don't really know him. We don't know. It's like the difference in reading a book about someone who lives down the street or actually getting to know them and going on walks with them and having them over for dinner. It's an intellectual head knowledge about them or a relational knowledge of really truly knowing them. And it's that truly knowing God and, the, and his character and being then able to trust him and receive his love. That's where the peace comes from. Yeah, and there's a scripture that makes it really clear that that is a dynamic of the way that we are made, that we can't get to peace really without this understanding of who God is. And the Second Peter 1, 2 scripture, which I just love this scripture, it goes, May grace, which is God's favor, and peace, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fears and agitation, agitating passions and moral conflicts be multiplied in you in the full personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So this is this is talking about a lot of all words here. We have all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity, uh, well-being. All of these things are based on the degree to which we understand correctly who Jesus and God are. So that's what the scripture is telling us. So it's really important to know them so that we can understand they are worthy of our trust and then therefore we can trust them. And it is out of that trust is where the peace comes that we're all so hungry for. We all want that supernatural peace where we can be assured in whatever situation we're in, we can have this sense of peace. It is absolutely necessary to get to know God and get to know Jesus to arrive at that place of peace that we're all looking for. Scripture makes it clear that we do have an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, who is the father of lies and is the deceiver. So the ultimate victory that Satan wants to win with God's children is to deceive us about God because everything flows from there. All of our experiences about life, our relationships, the way that we feel when we get up and, and launch the day and when we go to bed at night and close out the day and everything in between all emanates from what our view of God is, which is therefore the view of our life, our purpose in our life. Everything emanates from whether or not we are able to connect with God and know him truly to be who he really is. And so the enemy's most vigilant strategy for believers is to deter us from believing and knowing the truth about God and relating to him in a meaningful way. Yeah, it's a very successful strategy, and we know how successful it is because of the people who come here that we work with who have a wrong understanding of who God is. He's not someone that they can trust. He, they don't feel like that he is the father that he says he is, and so they are very burdened. They have fear. They don't trust him, and because they can't trust they have, have a very hard time having peace. They have a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, fears, and other kinds of things come because they have believed a wrong thing. They, have believe, they have really have a wrong picture, a wrong character in their heart of who he is. So we've seen a lot of suffering because of that one foundational thing. People will often report when they come to Rock House Center for counseling that they have a trust problem. Either they've noticed it, their family members have told them, or a therapist has told them they have a trust problem or someone in a small group at church has told them that. But what we don't typically understand is that underneath any trust problem is a foundational inability to trust God because we're 
we are wired to need him. We call them divine needs at Rock House Center. And so when he's not in that slot, we've got a radar, so to speak, that's out looking, searching for trying everything on for size. Is Does my husband or wife, will they fit in that slot? Can I trust them completely? Well, no, because they're they have failings, they disappoint us, they let us down, so they're not they're not infallibly trustworthy. We try everything else and then we get our children and whether our children are loving us, respecting us, uh, meeting our needs or, or making us feel loved or successful as a parent and they fail us. And so that feels like yet another feeling, I can't trust them. I can't trust my friend who lied to me because they're not, they, they did something that was clearly not trustworthy experiencing those things for what they are can't really happen in the right context until we get connected to the only one who is completely and totally trustworthy because we're wired to need that that 100 percent infallible trustworthy one and there is only one yeah and, and so when someone fails us when we have a foundational abiding trust in God, when somebody be, fails us and shows that they are, are untrustworthy, it's not fun, but it doesn't rock us to our foundation. We have a source of something that we can trust in 100%. I don't need that person to be absolutely trustworthy because that's satisfied by God. So I can have a level of resilience and peace, even when in great disappointment with whoever it is that I'm dealing with. But if we're going around looking for the person who's going to be that thing, that's going to, that person that's going to be ultimately trustworthy, that I can go, ah, I can rest in the reality that this person will never let me down. That person does not exist. If you have tried this over a number of years, and a lot of our clients have tried this and come in with a lot of disappointment and a lot of anger and a lot of frustration in relationships, just because the foundational place of trust wasn't satisfied in their relationship with the Lord. And so they were looking for more than any human could really deliver. And they were teed up to fail. They were teed up to be su to suffer because of that. So a way that it, you can identify if that's gone on in your heart is when we feel like a broken relationship is devastating. It just feels like the bottom dropped out in my life when someone broke up with me or a relationship ended or we discovered that someone we had really thought was our best friend has actually lied to us or gossiped about us, betrayed us, we find that someone has an affair, all those kinds of things that, like you said, are not, nobody is looking for that to happen or hoping that's going to happen. But the difference between it being a, a devastating blow that people describe in terms like my life just left the rails at that point. It, it, it just came apart. Everything came apart. And I haven't been able to get it back since then. It was devastating to me. Or, you know, the, the revelation that a parent has had some significant moral failing after you know all these years of representing a certain standard and then finding out that for a decade they had a secret life going on again not good basically a way that people describe those sorts of events it clearly feels like they feel like they lost god because the person was in the god role and when they did something that was so disappointing or actually sometimes can even be when the person dies it just feels like I lost, I lost it. I lost everything because it's feeling like I lost God because I don't know how to trust God. I've been looking to this person for that. Yeah, I've been trusting them for very foundational assurances about how life feels. So when I have this person in this place and they are, they are in this role in my life, then there's a tremendous amount riding on them. And if for some reason they're gone or they have a failing or whatever, then it rocks me to the core. The way I experienced this, when I first saw that there was something off in my relationship with God was when I recognized one day that when I thought about God's character and how I felt God felt about me and how I felt that relationship was going from his end, it really reflected tremendously on the relationship I had with my father in the early years were really the formative years of my life, you know, zero to 15 or 16, when we weren't getting along that well. And I had, a, it was amazing the number of things about my father I attributed to God. So 
as we call our parents, gods of our youth, they're the only, they're the big people that run the planet. They're the ones that we look to, to be the perfect trustworthy ones. And of course we're needy and small and they're available. And so they're there. And so we put all this uh, focus and weight, weight, sure. Uh, dependency on them for to answer the deepest things of who we are. And they get in this position where we slide them into that place. And if they have not talked about God, then they're the only God I've got. So they are the ones that are going to have to fill that place. So the gods of our youth can cause us to have wrong understandings about God. So they are ambassadors of God, it says in Ephesians 6. So they are representing his character. And we're built, really building a grid of who God is through the representation of our parents. You know what? All of our parents have failed to some degree. All of our parents have not represented God's character to us when we need it or the depth that we need it or whatever. So we have, in many cases, a significant amount of the failings of our parents smeared on our impression, on our grid, on our understanding of who God is. And that's the thing that we need to challenge by the standard of who he says he is and by his demonstrated behavior. And there are many things about God that demonstrate that he is fatherly and loving and trustworthy. And we need to touch that and we need to reject the lies and accept the truth of that he really is the perfect father. He really is the answer to the deepest needs that we have. Children also pick up lies about themselves based on the, the way that the gods of their youth have represented God, of course, unwittingly. Parents are not intentionally doing this. They've done the best they can do. We're not beating up Absolutely. on parents. Absolutely. And, you know, so I'm just thinking about the woman saying she remembered as a seven-year-old wishing that her mother loved her as much as she loved cigarettes and murder mysteries and concluding that there was something wrong with her as a child, that if I were just a better little girl, that mother would love me more. That's really a, also a lie about God's character, that he could even be that way. He could that he would be like an earthly parent with limitations on his love and be drawn off to something else that has captured his heart more than his child has captured his heart. And of course, that's not what it meant about that child's mother at all, but it's what the child interpreted. And so, you know, it's a very hopeful thing in, in just thinking about life the, in the role of a parent where we can realize things that we've done or misrepresented things about God to our children. And the objective is not a thought that we would ever be a perfect parent since no one is, but to just be able to recognize we want to redirect the course of where we're going and redirect our child to the true God. And so the, the focus for a parent becomes getting the depth of trust in God and the character of him in their own heart so that as they're representing it to their child, they can clearly, just honestly, communicate that I didn't represent him perfectly in this way or didn't represent him at all well in that way. But let me connect you to who God really is. I think of it like plugging in a wall socket. Connect directly to God as the real source, as the real trustworthy one that is what we all need. That's, that's what we need. That's what our children need so that we understand that, yes, in fact, I can trust him because he is eminently trustworthy and he's the one who's going to heal my heart and help me trust him. You know, there's just so many things. It's, it's hard not to dig into some of the realities of how father, how loving, what a great father God really is and all the things that he's done. And just the, his expression, of course, first represented by the story of the prodigal son where he rejoiced over the son's return. He obviously was distressed that the son ever left and took his, his possessions of the household with him. But when he returned, there was no conversation about that. It was just excitement and to have him returned and to restore him and to give him the robe and the ring and to take the fatted calf. I mean, clearly the message is that the love of God is absolutely supreme to all behavior of humans. And that just a great picture of the true character of God. He's not someone who's following you around with a clipboard to remember everything you've done wrong. He is not expecting the worst. He's expecting the best. He does not take account for evil, the scripture says. He has established us as his children, that he has brought us out of this place of sin and death where we were a, a spiritual eternal train wreck without him, and he came and saved us. He didn't have to just save us, but he also adopted, he adopted us, and then he also transferred us into the kingdom. 
And then he made us brothers and sisters of Christ, and he's preparing a home for us in heaven. And if you go beyond that, it talks about how he has made us a royal priesthood to ultimately at some point, as we progressively transform to reflect the the perfections and the virtues of his own son. This is the true heavenly father. And when we when we see our beliefs about our uh, who he is next to who he really is, we need to see the gap here that, and we need to reject those lies that don't line up with all that he has done to restore us to him and all that he has done to honor us and to treat us equally with Jesus himself. It says that he wanted to make us brothers and sisters of Christ. So what he's trying to tell you in this scripture is, and this is Romans eight twenty nine where he says that, he's, he's trying to tell you that he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He would withhold nothing from you that he would give Jesus. You're a brother and sister of Christ himself. That is who the Father is. And anything you believe that opposes that is something that we need to recognize and reject so that we can know that he is trustworthy and therefore trust him and therefore have the grace and all of the blessings that we talked about in the first scripture. Well, I think the way to get there, of course, is to ask God to get us there. There are... Um, Many people, thousands, millions of Christians walking around suffering, just feeling like, I wish I could trust God more, and can't do that, can't have the faith they wish that they could have. And it's always because of this. It's always an underlying misunderstanding, misrepresentation of God. And so, of course, God's waiting with arms open wide, usher us into his embrace and living under the shower of his truth and the shower of his love to receive all that he has for us. And so the pathway there begins with uh, just praying and asking God to change our hearts, to undo these things, and basically kind of like imprint a new stamp on our hearts. We've had a wrong imprint. Mm -hmm. We need to undo the old imprint or ask God to undo the old imprint and put a new imprint based on the truth of his character and his covenant relationship with us. Yeah, so let's move into prayer now about this particular thing. So Heavenly Father, we just ask you right now to invade our heart with the truth of who you are. Heavenly Father, reveal to us the lies that we have believed that have kept us from trusting you, the things that have caused us to maybe dishonor you, the things that have caused us not to be able to rest in you, to rely in you, to adhere to you, to really take ourselves our, under our own keeping and give ourselves over to you. Father, we know that you are worthy of all of those things. And Lord, we just reject right now every lie that comes to our mind about your character. We just reject all those things, Lord. And we send them back to hell where they belong. And we ask you, Father, that you would replace them with the truth of who you are, of how fatherly you are, how perfect your love is, all the things that you've done and worked to sacrifice us, to restore us to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you love us equally as you love your own son. Father, I ask that you would heal me of all the ways that I have suffered from the lies. Lord, I ask that you would build a assured and peaceful and trusting relationship out of the relationship I used to have with you. Lord, I ask that you would strengthen me to turn to you in all things. That you would cause me, Lord, to identify and resist the lies that may come into my thinking about who you are and replace them with the truth. Lord, I ask you to strengthen me. Lord, invade my heart and cause me to, to trust you completely based on who you are, Lord. I thank you that you are trustworthy. I thank you you are all that you, you claim to be. And I ask you, Lord, to give me peace. Give me the peace that comes from resting in you completely because of who you are. I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just agree with you on that. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in the hearts of the people who prayed this prayer here today and will continue to pray it. We thank you for joining us here in this podcast and look forward to speaking with you again soon. 
Yes. Thanks for being with us. Goodbye.